Well, hi everyone. Here we are again, Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson, and he's presenting rewriting history. Well, rewriting secular or popular history that you've probably been taught as fact, the new history that he's revealing to us. And of course, using genetics, archaeology, but it really is confirming biblical history is what's really happening. So part 14, Dr. Jensen, what happened to the Maya? While the Western Roman Empire was falling in Europe, in the Americas, one of the most spectacular civilizations was reaching its peak. With advanced astronomical capabilities, a precise calendar system, massive pyramids, and millions of people, the Mayans had no equals in their day. And a few hundred years later, the classic Mayan cities emptied. Their written inscriptions ceased. In short order, their enormous temples were swallowed by the jungle and remained hidden under these foliage for almost a thousand years. Many are still hidden today too. Then in the early 1800s, the mysterious classic Mayan civilization was rediscovered. But why did it disappear? Now, for decades, mainstream scholars have debated this question without resolution. But now, with new genetic discoveries in hand, this long-standing mystery might finally be resolved. So here we are with Dr. Nathaniel Jensen talking about what happened to the Maya. Very interested to see what happens here. So Dr. Jensen, part 14, let's go. This is one I've been excited about for a while because it's such a fascinating story. And it's one section of the larger story we're trying to understand. Who do we come from? What are the relationships among the very different peoples today? Even in the Americas, we've got multiple so-called races, ethnic groups. We have racism in the United States. Well, how do we relate to one another? And what's the relationship between us and the ancients? This is something that's going to be especially relevant as we discuss the Mayans and the questions that arose about who built that civilization. Who is responsible for it? I've assumed that the ancient cultures that were not in the part of Europe I trace my ancestry to must not be related to me in some way that's meaningful. And I've discovered that these sorts of assumptions are wrong. In 1839, two men set sail from New York City for Central America in pursuit of, rumor, ru, uh, in pursuit of rumors of stone ruins in the Central American jungles. These two gentlemen had visited and published on ancient Egypt. And if you've ever been or if you've seen pictures of it, you know what a massive, awe-inspiring civilization this was. Could there be something of equal magnitude in the Americas? If that promise existed, the potential for that existed, it would motivate me as well. What well, motivated John Stevens, a lawyer, and his British companion, artist and architect, Frederick Catherwood. Catherwood is not shown here because there are no surviving detailed portraits of what he looked like. So you only see Stevens. They arrived, 1839, and they were not disappointed. Not only were there some stone ruins, there was a massive, previously unknown civilization now buried in the jungles. And these images I'm showing here are the magnificent drawings of Catherwood. So this is pre-camera days. The only way you can communicate what you've seen to the outside world is by drawing it. And what he gave the, the outside world was a magnificent window into something not seen before. In the early 1800s, it was debated who the Native Americans came from. And that question was raised even more so by the existence of these spectacular ruins. Was it Phoenicians? Was it the ancient Romans who came over? Was it the ancient Egyptians who settled the Americas and built these pyramids? Because they had been to Egypt and because Stevens was a lawyer, he was able to successfully argue against those popular hypotheses and correctly argued, pre-genetic era, that these ruins were built by the people who live there currently. Now, which people, of course, is now a question we can ask, given what we've seen in genetics. The question also arises, what happened? Yes, this is a magnificent finding, not just some stone ruins, but an entire civilization the world had not known about before. 
it's similar to the Roman civilization being buried for thousands of years and someone in the early 1800s saying, ah, look what I found, the Colosseum, and then discovering that there was a, an entire rule and group of people whose reign stretched from Great Britain to the Middle East and covered North Africa, and it being a civilization we hadn't known about, history books hadn't discussed for thousands of years. Well, here we have a whole civilization lost for a thousand years, uncovered in the jungle. That in and of itself is spectacular, but raises perhaps more questions than it answers. Yes, this is magnificent, but why did it get buried and get lost for a millennium? What happened to the Maya that that would be swallowed up by the jungle and be hidden from Western eyes for a thousand years? Episode one, we saw that the world is smaller than we think. There's more connections among us than we've previously thought. If you go back a few hundred years and the world is 20 fold smaller in population size than it is now, you've got a lot fewer options for a spouse back then than today. And so either you marry someone who's a closer relative than you're comfortable with today, or you marry someone outside your group. And if the latter happens, this means the ethnic groups today are more connected more recently than we think. We looked at the number of ancestors each of us have in our family trees and go back a thousand years. There's far more people in each of our family trees than our people alive in the globe. The only way to solve this math problem is to make the family trees of each of your parents connect and mine and Ken's genealogies to connect and mine and for your viewers, our genealogies to connect. Well, this implies that ethnic change has happened frequently. If you're a creationist, yes, we've talked about this as being prompted by Babel. And yes, that's true, but it looks like ethnic change has happened repeatedly throughout human history, and oftentimes silently. We talked about the rates in episode four of human reproductive growth, and slight differences between ethnic groups can lead to the possibility that most Europeans are of recent African descent or Australian Aborigine descent. All that's theoretically possible with a small group of migrants coming in, and you don't see the evidence Physically today, I look Caucasian, but it's possible I have a very different answer than what I've been led to believe. We don't find these answers though with commercial genetic tests. You pay $100 to Family Tree and Me, or uh, 23 and Me, Family Tree DNA, one of these places, and they're going to tell you the answer from DNA that's inherited from both parents. That can't give you a very good answer because the, the gen genetic signal gets diluted every generation. There's other reasons why you can't go back more than four or five generations which is what I've already been able to trace through my dad's work in my own family tree. You need DNA that's inherited from one parent or the other parent that doesn't get diluted. It's only in theory mitochondrial DNA, which is maternally inherited DNA, or Y chromosome DNA, which is paternally inherited DNA. There's clocks that exist in our cells. It's the Y chromosome one that's the most useful. Both the maternally and paternally inherited DNA, though, mark off just 200 generations or less since the human race began. Our family tree is much more shallow than we think to go from eight people at the flood to the eight billion alive today in just a few, in, in 200 generational steps or less means this explodes very quickly and shrinks very quickly. If you look from the present backwards, you've got to connect the branches of the human family tree very quickly. So the number of Y chromosome differences, that's, that's what we settled on from episode six going forward. The male inherited DNA is what we're going to use to uncover the history of the human race by the number of differences among us. So if Ken and I have few Y chromosome differences between us, we must have a recent common ancestor. If there are many Y chromosome differences, we must have a distant common ancestor. The global human Y chromosome tree is the key to human history. And we began to uncover that history in episode seven, looking for the lost relatives of Europe. We found some of them in India of all places. These are not two civilizations that were apart for thousands of years and suddenly recovered contact in the 1600s with the East India Company. No, there's a recent connection that precedes that by 100 years, 1500s approximately. And we found out that the explanation for this has to do with the Mongols moving into Eastern Europe and then being pushed back out and Mongols coming down into India. It's, it's a connection due to Mongol heritage. The ancestor is not a Caucasian. The ancestor is not a, an Indian looking person, South Asian. It's a Central Asian person. We've seen that Central Asia also connects Europe to ancient China, a long-standing isolated civilization deliberately rejecting foreign influence, yet there's been episodes of foreign influence from the north. Those northern so-called barbarian tribes are the genetic link between Eastern Europe and ancient China. Central Asians also link 
modern Americans, majority of which are of recent Western European descent. This hidden history of the Americas reveals that the ancestors of most Americans are not who we think they are, not long-standing Europeans, they're Central Asian once again. And two-thirds of Western Europeans, which also means in the majority of the Americas, and two-thirds of Eastern Europeans, both trace their recent ancestry to Central Asia. That's remarkable. We don't look like Asians with slanted eyes and all the other features that we stereotypically associate with Asians. We look like Caucasians, yet the ancestry we've seen according to the family tree is Central Asian. And the way you can still look Caucasian today, yet have this recent Central Asian ancestry, goes back to the factors we discussed in episodes three and four about how the genetics works out. We've turned our attention in recent episodes to the pre-Columbian history of the Americas. Who are the Native Americans? We've seen that archeologically, even in mainstream science, there's a revolution that's happening. There were far more people here in the Americas than we've previously been led to believe, and they were far more advanced than we previously thought. And this has spectacular implications for how we think about the Amazon in particular, the, the rainforest in South America. This does not look like archeologically a pristine wilderness that's been untouched by primitive peoples for thousands of years. No, they were actively cult cultivating it and transforming it before Columbus ever arrived. And we've seen that before Columbus arrived, the Americas were resettled. The Native Americans today were not the first Americans, and this is not some creationist working in some back corner of the internet trying to rewrite racial identities and these sorts of things. We've seen in the previous episode that there appears to be written records, if not many other oral records, that echo this discovery in genetics. So I've concluded I'm not announcing a new discovery. I'm recovering old history that's been neglected. Well, what happened to the Maya? That's what we want to discuss today. If you're like me, the Native Americans have, in, in my, my understanding growing up, a strong North American connection. What we've seen, though, is that the, the genetic discoveries we've uncovered have implications up and down the Americas, and the implications are shocking. Today's Native Americans are not the first Americans. They arrived from Central Asia in the early AD era, around 250 to maybe 800 AD, somewhere in there. We have to, we're not quite precisely sure, sure which, which date it is, and we'll discuss in future episodes and try to uncover the exact history there. And apparently they wiped out whoever was here first. That's as, that's as far as we've gotten, and it's raised all sorts of questions we've never thought of asking before. Why did they leave Central Asia? What happened once they got here? And who were the first peoples who preceded them? Written histories, oral histories from Native Americans appear to describe for us what happened. The Delaware record, we looked at this map, and I'm going to point out that this map is largely confined to North America. Yes, there are points at which the Delaware record branches off and there are people who break away, but it's silent on their fate. And if you're like me growing up, the history of the Americas south of the Rio Grande before Columbus is largely a mystery. So let's begin with some things that might be more familiar, even if you didn't discuss this in history in, in history class growing up. The Aztecs were the magnificent and human sacrificing civilization, dark civilization, that were in existence when the Spaniards arrived. Here you can see some of the geographic realm of the Aztec or the Mexica Empire. Their capital city, Tenochtitlan, was basically the site of modern-day Mexico City, but modern-day Mexico City exists on a site that was once a lake. And Tenochtitlan, the, the capital city, was basically a city on the waters. Here's a mural of what many thought it looked like and what archaeology is now uncovering. Lake has since been drained, but what it looked like apparently was a tremendous sight for the Spaniards who first arrived. So here's a quote from one of the Spaniards accompanying Cortez, who we'll talk about more in a moment, when they first saw the Aztec capital. This contemporary then says, during the morning we arrived at a broad causeway and continued our march towards Itzapalapa. And when we saw so many cities and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land and that straight and level causeway going towards Mexico, we were amazed and said that it was like the enchantments they tell us, tell, tell us, uh, tell of in the legend of Amadis on account of the great towers and temples and buildings rising from the water and built of masonry 
and some of our soldiers asked, or that the things that we saw were not a dream. That's how overwhelmed they were by the sight of this advanced civilization. And again, this is part of this revolutionary understanding we're gaining of the pre-Columbian Americas. These were advanced peoples, not primitive Stone Age cultures, who constructed things they wouldn't have dreamed of. And Charles Mann in his book 1491 talks about how some of these cities were likely larger in size than European cities that were their contemporaries in their day. Cortez was the conqueror of Mexico. He led his men first to the Caribbean and then across the Gulf of Mexico to the shores of modern day Mexico and moved his men inward. So he had this very small band of conquistadors with him. They were able to overthrow thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Aztecs through the help of the other nations surrounding the Aztecs and other, under the Aztecs' thumb. These nations, of course, didn't appreciate having to pay taxes and send their boys to be sacrificed by the Aztecs, and so joined with Cortes and were a key component of his war force that overthrew the Aztec Empire. What appears to be, though, perhaps the biggest factor in the eventual success of this very small band of Europeans was the diseases that they brought with them, and perhaps inadvertently, unknown to them, destroyed countless numbers of Native Americans and led to the victory of the Europeans over those who were there at the time of their arrival. Aztecs, though, weren't completely wiped out. They spoke the language Nahuatl, and you may not know that to this day, even though Spanish is the main language in Mexico, countless indigenous languages survive, one of which, shown here in this sort of salmon color, a waddle, remains spoken to this day. They were decimated, but not completely wiped out. So that's one aspect that might be more familiar to you, more familiar to me. This is something I've heard. Yes, Aztecs, that's some of their history, more close to the arrival of Columbus. Further south, on the western coast of South America, in the Pacific, was this massive Incan civilization, which is, again, I'm guessing something you've heard of. If for no other reason, then they built this glorious city in the mountains at a high altitude, Machu Picchu. Another reason you might have heard of it was a reason that attracted Spanish attention early on. There were many reasons for the arrival of the Spanish in the New World. One was, of course, trying to find a passageway to India and to the spice trade, which, of course, famously and infamously was why Columbus called the natives that he encountered Indians. He thought it was in India. Another purpose that they came over for was religious conversion, Catholic conversion to Catholicism. But it didn't take long for the rumors of ink and gold to reach their ears, and the conquest and recovery of this gold to be one of their purposes as well. Pizarro was the conqueror of the Incan Empire. And again, one of the main reasons that archaeology, historical investigation, is uncovering for his success, his small band was the bringing with them of diseases to which Native Americans were not resistant. Didn't, it, it decimated them. Once again, though, it didn't completely wipe them, out, wipe them out. The language of the Incan Empire was Quechua, and Quechuan languages continue to be spoken in the Americas, in Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, parts of Argentina to this day. So even though Spanish, Portuguese are the primary languages, the indigenous languages survive to this day. So there are some handles by which we can begin to understand the Mayans, some historical time points by which we can think about the Mayan civilization. Let's put this in some context that might be more familiar, European history. I'll put that above this blue timeline. I've put uh, these tan colored bars as 500 year intervals so that we have some references and down here below the, the 500 year BC AD time point. Well, let's think about European history so that we have some context in which to think about pre-Columbian history, the Aztecs, the Incas, and the Mayans. Well, if you've taken history like I did, most European history begins with the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. I've implied a certain time period here. It may disagree slightly with the mainstream time scale. In future episodes, we'll discuss the justification for this. They're early. That's, that's the main point I want to give here. They're the earliest European civilizations that most history books talk about, and they're largely Aegean Mediterranean on the island of Crete and around the area of modern day Greece. These were civilizations that left ruins to this day, and if you look at them, they're quite spectacular. You can imagine how these very early European civilizations 
looked in their heydays. This is the throne room of one of these. You can see the queen's room here. Look at that mural above the door. These are, these are advanced civilizations, some of the earliest in Europe. But they're, they're 1500 BC, 1700 BC, very, very early times. And it's about a thousand years later when perhaps more familiar European civilizations enter the, enter the textbooks. Alexander the Great around the 300s BC goes on a, an attempted world conquest from the Mediterranean all the way to the, to the borders of India. We of course know there's civilizations in India and in China at this time, but he, he's conquering much of, of the known world in his, his escapades. His civilization though, he dies yet young, it's split up among his generals and the remnants of the Greek civilization are eventually conquered by the Romans. The Romans rule North Africa, part of the Middle East, Western Europe, it splits into Western and Eastern halves, the Roman Empire does eventually. The Western half is conquered by the barbarians, so-called barbarians, the Germanic tribes and even a Central Asian tribe or two. The Eastern European Empire survives for another millennia. We often think of it not as a Roman Empire, but as the Byzantine Empire. They fall in the 1400s. Western Europe, though, falls, as we've been taught, into the Dark Ages. This is technically the beginning of the Middle Ages. I tend to think of the Middle Ages, though, as associated with knights and castles and, and the time period more around the 1000 AD, 1200 AD. Eventually, the Middle Ages give way to the Renaissance, recovery of the classical Roman and Greek learning. And around the same time as when Europeans decide to venture out from their European peninsula and explore the world, which, of course, brings us to Columbus, the Portuguese moving around Africa to India, and the arrival of the modern world, global world as we know it. Well, the Aztecs and the Incas are very late by comparison in pre-Columbian history. So there's their context in terms of Europe. And the first thing that strikes me and may strike you is how much blank space there is in the pre-Columbian Americas prior to them. The Aztecs founded Tenochtitlan in the early 1300s. The Incas ruled in the 1400s. They're very, very late in pre-Columbian history. There's a lot that's not discussed, if that's all we know about the pre-Columbian Americas. Who were the earliest Americans? In terms of civilizations, the Olmecs were, they're in Mexico. This talks about, this, this uh, map shows their formative period in 600 BC. You can trace it back even earlier than that. If this is unfamiliar to you, you might know them inadvertently through their famous sculptures, these massive carved heads, which we'll return to in future episodes as we think about the identity of who the first Americans were. So think about them as, roughly around the same time as the Minoans and the Mycenaeans in Europe. We're gonna talk about precisely why I picked the dates that I do in future episodes. The next pre-Columbian, earlier pre-Columbian civilization to which I wanna draw your attention was the massive city of Teotihuacan in Mexico. And you can find these ruins just outside Mexico City today if you travel there. This was founded and, and began in the, in the century or two before the time of Christ, so about 150 BC and lasted until about AD 650. So they, around the time of the Roman Empire, when they're getting started, they're contemporary with the Romans, and then they outlast them, not falling until about 650 AD. Romans about the 400s, Western Roman Empire about the 400s. Mainstream archaeology talks about the evidence in these cities, in this particular city, for violent collapse. So this is estimated to be a couple hundred thousand people living here. This is a massive structure. This is the Pyramid of the Moon, the even larger Pyramid of the Sun you can find to this day. You can see the tiny people here, just to give you some sense for size, that, that are climbing this pyramid. So here's a, here's a, a massive advanced civilization. Construction, constructing these large pyramids makes it reminds you of the pyramids of ancient Egypt. So they underwent a violent collapse in AD 650. Other cities around them survived and underwent their own collapse around AD 900. So there's Teotihuacan. Now we've got some anchor points some time points by which to understand the Mayans. Their civilization shows up right around here, contemporary with Teotihuacan, have interactions with Teotihuacan. Geographically though, the Mayans tend to revolve around the Guatemala, modern day Guatemala, the, the lowlands here. They spill over into Honduras. And of course they're in the Yucatan Peninsula and parts of, of Southern and Southeastern Mexico. Unlike the Aztecs and the Incas, the Mayans had written language, not language that is familiar to Western eyes. They used a, a, a system of glyphs shown here to communicate. They were noted astronomers, and as is typical with those who study the stars, they developed a very precise calendrical system 
you may not have heard of it, or you may have heard of it and didn't know it. There was talk, of course, in 2012 about the end of the world predicted by the Mayan calendar. Well, the Mayan calendar goes through cycles, and 2012 was a change in one of the cycles, and so people wondered if this was the end of the world. What we discussed a few minutes ago, of course, was the massive structures that they built. This is what Cather would depicted, very, a very good depiction in pre-camera days. Here's a more recent photograph then of the very intricate structures these people constructed. Look at the artistry that's involved in their carvings. I was thrown off initially looking at some of the, the human forms they carved because they looked like a style that was almost grotesque to me. And I had to correct my thinking, studying these, these images more closely. Notice, first of all, the very fine and precise and accurate anatomical detail in the shape of the eyes, the structures of the face, the nose, the lips, the chin, the arms. These people knew what they were doing. This wasn't some system of art where they, they exaggerated and, and made some sort of grotesque representation of the human body. What threw me off, though, was the shape of the head. And that's where I thought, well, maybe this is just some weird style they've invented. Turns out the Mayans practiced a form of head binding. So babies, after they're born, the way you do this is you, is you, 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 you can deform the skull because it's not fused and it's growing over time. You can deliberately bind it to a, a board and cause it to be flattened and extended over time. And that apparently was desirable in Mayan culture because, I don't know, you can... You can wrap things around it and, 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 and wrap your hair up. And, and that, that was fashion back then, I guess. So they've practiced a form of head binding. They're skilled artists is my point. I was thrown off initially because of apparently this practice of head binding, which leads to very accurate sculptures depicting these flat heads that re reflected who they were. It's not necessarily some certain style, it's just what they did. So they're skilled artists and they recorded their own history. These are the stairway to one of their temples or, or pyramids. Zooming in here, you can see that each of these stairs, it's been eroded over time, but these stairs have glyphs recorded into them. Glyphs, their alphabet, they're recording events and other things in their structures. The kings and queens recorded monuments to themselves, and you can actually reconstruct a series in these various Mayan cities of kings and queens and, and, and their activities. This particular stela here, stele, has, if we zoom in on the side, you may not be able to see it here, these glyphs again recorded. There's so much detail in these carvings that they're, they're, they're leaving for us a record of activities. And of course, the Mayans are known for their temples and numerous, innumerable it seems, temples and palaces, all exquisitely carved. Their complex buildings and towers, all of this again hidden from Western eyes for a thousand years. More buildings, tombs, and, and pyramids, innumerable pyramids, massive cities, and more pyramids, and more pyramids, and more pyramids. These people were builders like no others. Chichen Itza, shown here, of course, they didn't always look this way, they were buried under the jungle. And it's taken years and of course to recover them. There are pyramids that are still hidden in the jungle and covered by this overgrowth and are continued to be studied to this day. Now, if some of this caught your eye as familiar, it may be because you're a movie goer. I like to say I lived under a rock growing up and didn't watch the Star Wars series until after getting married. Uh, within the last few years, watch it with my wife. And so if you say, ah, that looks familiar. That's because this is the scene for, in the Star Wars series, Planet Yavin 4. And because I'm a, I'm a nerd and culturally live under a rock and had been studying pre-Columbian history before watching Star Wars, I being the nerd that I was, announced as they showed these scenes, Central America, I recognize that. So there you go, Mayans show up apparently in the future in Star Wars. These were buried for so long that even Cortez, so he arrives in the early 1500s, conquers the Aztecs, which are up this way in Mexico. He makes a journey down through Guatemala, modern day Guatemala, and, and over here to get back to the Gulf of Mexico, walks right past these ruins and apparently never sees them. That's how, and, and to this day, there are Mayan ruins. You can be walking through the jungle. It's so overgrown. You can walk right past it. You have no idea you're standing next to a pyramid. Mayans, at least their language, survive to this day multiple forms of it, Yucatec Maya up here in the, in the Yucatan Peninsula. 
So there were survivors apparently of the Mayan civilization, but something must have happened for this massive edifice and civilization to be swallowed up by the jungle. And I wanna point out that there's still Mayan ruins being discovered to this day. Here's one paper that I think you can find for free online from September 2018, within the last two years, the results of new technology they're applying to the Mayan jungle. So this is still thick rainforest. And what mainstream science has been doing is taking a, a form of radar technology. It's called LIDAR. It's an acronym for light and radar. They'll fly back and forth over the jungle in a plane, shooting radar down at the jungle canopy. And the way it works, there's enough beams that are shot down to bounce back. Computers then can, can uh, untangle all the signals and remove the jungle canopy so you can see what the forest floor looks like. And what has emerged are far more structures in these jungles than we've ever imagined. And what this paper in particular reached as a conclusion was estimates of the population size. So they said, okay, now there are all these, these there are many more structures than we previously thought. And again, this is all just in the last two years. And if you have a subscription to Netflix or one of these other channels, there's uh, maybe it's Disney Plus, National Geographic has a four part series describing the findings of this particular study showing just how much more there's present in the jungle than we thought. Well, these authors, and you can read the paper if you're interested for yourself, they say, okay, we, we look at the new structures we've discovered, and then we say, what sort of population could support? Uh, could, could these cities support and, and, and these, these farmlands and such? You can see the evidence for this, the terraces or, or evidence of, 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 archeo of uh, agricultural activity. And what sort of people would be required to build these structures? They run through all this math and they say, we estimate that in, in its heyday, so the classic era of Mayan civilizations from about AD 250 to around 900-ish, so right in the middle of that, about 8,700, we estimate, they say, that in this, just this region, shaded here in red, and you can barely see it, this small little peninsula in South America, excuse me, in Central America, there were seven to 11 million people living in this part of the world. Well, what, what's a number without context? What does that mean? Well, let's compare it to Europe. There were as many people living in this small fingerprint, that shaded red area of Central America in the Mayan heyday. There were as many people there as were in this much of Europe. There were as many people concentrated in, South Amer in, in Central America as were the combined populations at this point in history of the British Isles, Scandinavia, big chunks of Eastern Europe, and even spilling over into the, to the Balkan Peninsula. All those modern countries shaded in orange, their combined populations in 8,700 were equal to the high end of that estimate for Mayan civilization. So this is a massive number of people living here. Their beginnings go back into the, to the, to the late BC era, shortly before the time of Christ, the Mayan civilization started as the Olmec civilization was declining, the Mayans got their beginnings. The heyday, as I mentioned, the classic era is partially contemporary with the classic Roman civilization. So Rome, time of Christ, and then falling around the 400s, Mayans, the classic civilization is 250, and they, they extend beyond the fall of the Roman civilizations. The Roman Empire is falling, they're in their peak, and they continue in their peak until uh, almost up till 1000 AD. Well, right around AD 750, 850 to around 900, 1000 AD, suddenly the Mayan cities empty of people, the stone monuments cease to be built, the kings stop recording their histories, and it collapses. In the Yucatan, so that this, when I'm saying collapses, we're talking about the area right here that's still largely covered by jungle. In the Yucatan, there are still Mayan activity. So the collapse happens here, it also collapse, collapse happens in, in Mexico. Mayan activity continues up this way, but it's fair to ask the question whether the Mayan speakers today are the descendants of the classic era Mayan peoples. Why would I even say that? Because the Toltecs, the Mexican civilization that arises in the 900s, invades the Yucatan Peninsula, leaves obvious archeological evidence of Mexican influence. And this pyramid, Chichen Itza, built in 90, uh, 950, uh, is, is part of that era. So 
Mayan civilization collapses in the central Mayan lowlands. There's continuing activity in the Yucatan, but it's fair to ask whether or not these people today and the Mayan speakers today are descendants of Toltecs who happen to retain Mayan languages, or if they're actually connected genealogically to the people in the central Mayan lowlands. So this question of the classic era Mayan collapse, why the city's empty, the building stops, and it, it, it's gone, swallowed up by the jungle in short order. Even Wikipedia calls the classic Mayan collapse one of the great unsolved mysteries of archaeology. As many explanations in a sense for that in mainstream science as there are in mainstream science for the demise of the dinosaurs. Nobody knows the answer. There's lots of theories propounded, hypotheses put forth, but nobody knows. So they, they have their, their climax, the, the Mayans in, in, the, in the first thousand years in the AD era, and then about 900 or 1,000, they, they disappear. And there's, there's a, a, a petering, so to speak, of these, at least of Mayan speakers in the Yucatan Peninsula that lasts up until the point, and even goes beyond the initial conquistador incursions. There were Mayan-speaking peoples who were resisting conquistadors, even up to close to the modern era. But what about the classic era collapse? Why is this still a great unsolved mystery? And are there any answers that are plausible today? Well, enter the genetics that we discussed in episode 12. Again, we pointed out that it's the young earth time scale, the young earth model, that's the only model that successfully finds in genetics the smoking gun, the flat lining, that's the smoking gun of a population collapse, and it was large enough, it had retroactive effects. See episode 12 for the, for the explanation justification for why that is. Mainstream science talks about the collapse. What they do not talk about and do not detect is the recovery. So there's about 300 years of death and destruction among Native Americans, and they finally recover in population in the 1800s and 1900s, and the exact date depends on where you are in the Americas. We can, as young earth creationists, recover that and detect that. So if it's working in the post-Columbian era, we can trust it in the pre-Columbian era. Well, lo and behold, and, and let, me, let me stop here for a second. Again, this is research in progress. These um, dates I'm giving always have a little bit of, of an asterisk with them. This is what we know right now. And there's still a little bit of uncertainty where exactly Noah is in the tree. I've narrowed him down to a very small window. Well, if Noah is where I think he is, my best guess right now, the people, that, the people we call Native Americans today are actually not the first Americans, but they came over from Central Asia around 600 to 800 AD. And look at this. They undergo massive population growth and dispersal in the Americas, 800 to around 1000 AD. Exactly at the same time, the Mayan civilization is collapsing, apparently without explanation mainstream science. If Noah is in a different position, that means the Central Asian invaders came over 200 to about 500 a day, and they undergo massive population growth and dispersal throughout the Americas, 500 to 700, which is about the same time even mainstream archaeologists talk about the violent overthrow of that massive pyramid-building city of Teotihuacan. Again, my best guess is Noah's here, but this is still a question we're trying to solve. Either way, the arrival of the Central Asian invaders right about here offer some very tantalizing clues to why either the city of Teotihuacan collapsed, these massive py pyramid builders had their city emptied, or why perhaps the Mayan civilization itself ceased building these monuments to their kings, ceased building the pyramids in the Guatemalan lowlands, and eventually were swallowed up by the jungle. How many other mysteries are waiting to be solved in the DNA of today's Native Americans. This is the new history of the human race. What we're seeing is not only are there revisions to how we understand our ethnicities, we're seeing that the Young Earth model offers solutions to long-standing mysteries in mainstream archaeology and offers an entirely new paradigm by which to investigate this dark era of human history long, mysterious, and unknown, the history of the Americas before Columbus. So, Dr. Jensen, people will say, okay, well, why did the Mayans die? You said you're going to give the answer. So what are you really saying? What we have so far is evidence from genetics that there was a massive dispersal and apparently population replacement that very intriguingly seems to coincide 
with the collapse of the Mayan civilization or the collapse of the city of Teotihuacan. So here's a potential cause effect relationship. What we don't know yet is, did these people come over and violently overthrow? You look at the red record, the, uh, the Delaware history, which now is beginning to emerge as perhaps one of the most important documents we're seeing now, given its correlations to genetics, perhaps one of the most important documents, not just for North America, but for understanding South American history of, of the Americas before Columbus. Is this hint in the Delaware Red Record of when, when they talk about their, their sachem, their leader, uh, after I am their sachem, there were, there were 10 sachems, unnamed, and much evil was then. Is this a reference to the dispersal of these people through the Americas and violent overthrow of perhaps people like the Mayans? Were the Mayans one of the first peoples here? These are questions and hypotheses that these correlations begin to raise. Alternatively, looking at what happened when Europeans arrived, and given perhaps a millennia or two of a time gap between the arrival of these Central Asians and perhaps the first peoples, could the Central Asians themselves have brought other diseases to the Americas? Again, the Red Record says 10,000 crossed the Bering Strait. Well, if there's seven to 11 million people in the Central, Central American lowlands, is that a sufficient force of 10,000 people to overthrow? Now, again, we look at genetics and they came over and then they went under, under massive population growth. So their numbers obviously increased. But could they have brought with them, unknowingly, just like Europeans did, diseases to which the first Americans were not resistant? That seems like a plausible hypothesis to test, especially if building suddenly ceases. And mainstream archaeologists will say there's evidence archaeologically in Teotihuacan of violent overthrow, burning and destruction. We don't see that in the Americas. Is it because there wasn't a violent overthrow? It was a quiet, everybody died suddenly because of diseases. So what I'm saying is we have a very intriguing potential cause-effect relationship that is begging for someone to investigate this further. And one of the ways to investigate this further is to begin to gather more DNA sequences from Native Americans up and down the Americas to see if there's more details that can be illuminated, as well as this is begging for a re-deep dive into archeology span with a new framework, because this is something no mainstream archeologist is even considering, because in mainstream archeology span and mainstream genetics, Everyone in the Americas is related back to those first people who came over in 15,000 years ago. They spread throughout the Americas. And so no one is even thinking about the possibility that some foreigners came over subsequently from Central Asia and went up and down the Americas wreaking havoc and destruction or disease wherever they go. So this is asking for someone to say, let's go back and look at the record with this new potential hypothesis in mind and see how it plays out. So what happened to the Maya? Here are some new clues that may in the next few years, illuminate an answer to this long-standing mystery, but an answer that no one has considered before because no one's thinking in terms of the Young Earth time scale, which again, I wanna emphasize, it's only the Young Earth time scale that illuminates and recapitulates the post-Columbian history. So from a purely scientific perspective, this is the time scale people should be using going forward to understand and investigate and solve mysteries of the pre-Columbian world. So it's another example that your worldview if you don't question the presupposition of a worldview you have, you might interpret the evidence absolutely in the wrong way. Yes. And really, if you're committed to the long ages and a sort of an evolutionary view of history, you apply that to the evidence, you're gonna come up with the wrong interpretation, but you have a different worldview, you're willing to think differently about this. Uh, it radically changes what the world is teaching us. Yes. And maybe, tell, uh, you know, we've heard in recent times people talking about herd immunity. Well, maybe the minds didn't have that herd immunity they needed to these other diseases, right? Because they, they hadn't mixed together that much with others. Yes. And you think about the, the, the Black Death in Europe. This is something we're going to discuss uh, in future episodes and thinking about who, who were the first Europeans. What about the Vikings? Are there any people today or their descendants? Can we find the Vikings in genetics? The more you dig into it, the more you see disease rearing its ugly head all throughout human history and concepts of herd immunity and indigenous resistance or lack thereof playing key roles in the history of the human race and key roles 
in illuminating and, and dictating who we are as peoples today to whom we trace our ancestry. So this is a theme that shows up prominently in the Americas with the arrival of Europeans. We're seeing it may play a prominent role in the pre columbian history, is playing a prominent role today, and may in fact be the rule all throughout human history. Time and time again, people's ruling then, disease comes and wipes them out, and then you have to ask the question, do they have any descendants today? Do the Romans, do the, Romans the ancient Greeks, do they have any descendants in the modern world? These are questions we're gonna explore then in future episodes as well. Well, Dr. Jensen, for those that haven't seen the rest of the series, they can go to the Answers in Genesis YouTube channel and be a playlist there, or subscribe to answers.tv, very inexpensive, answers.tv, and this series will be there, plus hundreds and hundreds of other videos and live programs and future live conferences from Answers in Genesis. And we're going to go on to 15 and 16 next week. I mean, how many episodes do you think we'll have totally? I'm estimating about 20 to 25. Next week, we'll look at the question of what was going on in Central Asia? Can we pinpoint who these people came from when they crossed the Bering Strait, came into the Americas? What is their story? Why did they arrive? And in episode 16, we'll try to get back to that thorny question of who were the first Americans? And uh, the title I have in mind right now is uh, Mysteries of the Ancient Pacific and the Early Americans and potential connections there. Of course, the ancient Pacific, Australian Aborigines, Papua New Guineans, another very dark chapter of human history where there's virtually nothing known about what's going on. Archaeology is trying to illuminate some of these answers. Well, what happens if we bring genetics to bear? And are there any connections between these people of the ancient Pacific and the Americas? And I should mention for episode 15, uh, the, the running title I have right now is the ancient European connection to the Native American. So lots in store coming up. And at, at some point, we're going to shift back to the, to the uh, to the early Europeans, to Africans, and to the most ancient times, cradles of civilization. So all this is still forthcoming. Future episodes, I hope our viewers will join us then. And then 2021, hopefully, you'll have a book released on all this. I mean, very unique. Nobody else is doing this because you're a biblical creationist who understands genetics, and you're studying genetics, but you have a love of history, and meshing that all together and coming up with the new history of the human race, rewriting history but it's 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 not a new history in the sense of an overall history because the bible gives us the big overview but certainly a new history in regard to looking at all these different civilizations and showing how it all fits together in a particular way and genetics has great bearing on explaining what has happened and then it makes sense it all fits within that biblical time frame yes Yep, new because we haven't had these tools until recently. We haven't had the DNA sequences from people around the globe. Right. First human sequence, 2001. The data are just emerging. And what makes it even more new is no one's looking at it through the right worldview. We have the biblical framework. And with the biblical framework in hand and inserting this new DNA evidence, oh, this is who we are. We've finally been able to answer these questions we've had no answers to or no direct answers to until now. Well, there we are. Get ready for 15 and 16. And that'll be next week, and we'll continue on to about 20, 25 episodes all together. We'll see how it all plays out as Dr. Nathaniel Jensen actually is presenting to you that cutting edge research that he's done in regard to genetics and history. We'll look forward to seeing you next week, Dr. Jensen. Thank you.